Good evening, everyone. I am Usha Naya, and I am broadcasting from Ipo, Malaysia, and I am your moderator this evening for this first webinar by the Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthetists. Thank you all for logging on. And we have a series of lectures uh, followed by a survey at the end of all the talks. And if you fill the survey and submit it, you will receive a certificate of attendance. All right. And at the end of every session, if there are questions you would like to ask or, or uh, relate to any speaker, please uh, record your question in the Q&A section. If there's a particular question that you want to ask a particular speaker, you may indicate that. So we will start, we have five speakers today. And before we start the session, I would like to invite Prof. Uh, Sunirat Kong, Kong who is the president of ASPA, and a consultant and professor of anesthesia in Mahidol University to give us her welcome speech. Please welcome Prof. Sunira. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the president of the Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists, I would like to welcome everyone to the webinar series as perfect. Asperfect is a focused learning education experience, web-based education series, a smart online classroom where we can learn and teach together. The aim to help improve education and quality of pediatric anesthesia, pediatric perioperative life support, and perioperative care of pediatric patients. This is a series of webinars present every third Sunday of each one by experts from the Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists. We cordially invite everyone to join us in our Ingro as Perfect webinar with the first uh, webinar update on the best practice, the impact of COVID-19 on pediatric anesthesia in the Asian country. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Prof. Sunira. We will start the series of lectures. And our first speaker is Dr. Alinda Oracion, who is a senior consultant, pediatric anesthetist from Manila, Philippines. And her topic today is COVID-19 in children, vulnerability 2.0. May I welcome Dr. Alinda. Good day, everybody, and thank you for your kind introduction, Usha. Okay, my topic is COVID-19 in children, vulnerability 2.0. Now, children are considered a vulnerable population. Vulnerability has actually taken a dramatic turn or change, if you will. The present situation due to COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented, and it has actually made a major impact on healthcare delivery. Reorganization is necessary. And this reorganization includes the perioperative care of children. It actually includes the changes to this. Now, during this pandemic, children, infants, and young people need to be properly cared for. And the consequences of failing to maintain services can actually result in stress and anxiety. It can result in delays in guidance, screening, and also vaccination. It can render children victims of violence and abuse. We are concerned that children present to hospitals later than usual because parents and their caregivers actually have fear of being exposed to the hospitals, fear of being exposed to the virus. So the impact is actually 
um, a, an increase in the rise of urgent medical and surgical interventions. And this could actually increase the risk of poor outcomes. But do not fear because certainly there is always a way forward. So let's go to stress and anxiety. When you talk about this, we need to know as parents that we should teach our children to do hand washing, eat healthy, exercise regularly. We need to make sure that they get their vaccines. We need to make sure that we, they are taught not to touch their faces, their mouth, their nose. But you must remember that little hands are always instinctively reaching out. So we need to make a game out of this. But then there are also common questions that children ask. When they ask about what the virus is all about, we see that it's a germ that makes people feel sick. When they ask how it spreads, we tell them that maybe it goes, it goes into the air when someone coughs. Why do people wear masks? Because we don't want them to be sharing germs with us. Can you die from this new virus? Well, a lot of people get sick, but they don't die from this. That's why there are doctors who make sure that patients are being taken care of. What is important, however, is that you make sure that they know how to put on their mask and take it off as well. They know how to use it properly and the children under two should not be wearing face masks. We need to provide reassurance to children. We need to model calmness as parents limit exposure and make sure that when they start asking questions repetitively, we need to reassure them because this is their way of coping. Of course, this is a universal crisis, and this is brought about by psychological stress due to school closure, limited mobility, and probably hunger and malnutrition. Families have faced income losses. The closure of schools have, uh, have given children a uh, reason for getting hungry. They get hungry because they refer to, they prefer school meals sometimes, or they rely on this for nutrition. In a joint analysis by the UNICEF and Save the Children organization, it is said that it's not only 106, but probably by the end of 2020, we will have seen 672 million poor and hungry children. Now let's go to these delays. What can we do to help here? How do we provide optimal guidance? Of course, we need to make sure that we avoid sick people. Remember, it's impossible to know who has the infectious germs. And the coronavirus, if you think about it, render people contagious even if they don't show any signs or symptoms. So you need to be aware of people coughing or sneezing, stay some distance away from them, Practice the healthy habits, washing your hands, and if you don't need to go out, stay home. Now, if the child has fever and cough, you make sure that we try to call the doctor and find out what we need to do or make children feel better but making sure that they stay hydrated, give them medication to, to, to help the fever go down, use humidifier if needed, and certainly to rest. Of course, when I say rest, it doesn't mean that they should be glued to the TV. There are warning signs and problems as well. This could be trouble breathing, severe cough that won't stop, high fever that doesn't come down, unusual sleepiness, inability or pain that you cannot take away, unusual rash or vomiting and diarrhea. Now you need to bring the patients to the doctor. Children should not suffer complications due to preventable conditions and the late access to care. Because what can, you have, what can happen when you have these delays? First of all, we should remember that children still grow during the pandemic and their immunity needs to grow with them. So this pandemic has actually caused a disruption of the immunization calendar and rendered children not fully protected. So we need to make sure that they are vaccinated when they come to us for care. Now, you should, we should tell parents that they should not ignore any signs and symptoms that the child tells them because we cannot allow things like what this 15-year-old experienced we, when she only decided to seek consultation, when she only experienced intractable pain, when true enough, 
weeks before she had ex been experiencing on and off pain. So she ended up having um, she had ended up, up having surgery, and this is what they saw: an ovarian new growth. We cannot also be like this 12-year-old who was hit by the pandemic. He sought consultation in February due to a tooth extraction and was unable to follow up because of, uh, because of uh, difficulty in being able to see the doctors during this time and he had anemia, so it was any biopsy or procedure was not allowed. Then the lockdown and the quarantine came. So he ended up coming to our institution with a large submandibular mass that provides, that has, that renders him bleeding profusely also at this point, still anemic and probably also having difficulty in swallowing. So can you imagine the nightmare for the anesthesiologist at this point? We should remember that the world is facing a health crisis. We can help prevent another. Now, when we talk about children who are victims, what do we want to talk about? What do I want to tell you about this? Well, disaster increase violence threefold that has been seen in research. COVID is a form of disaster. And what does this do? The, this pandemic increases the risk for violence due to stress, weak institutional responses, confinement, disruption of social and protective networks, and decreased access to care. Tension is high during this time. So what did we see in the Philippines? The Women and Child Protection Unit showed that from January to sometime in April, the reports have been going down. But when it came to June, it was going up again during the quarantine and the lockdown. Sexual abuse and physical abuse were going up, but not as much as January. But we must remember, these are reports, and these do not certainly talk about the actual incidents. Another organization, Bantay Bata, has also shown that before the enhanced community quarantine, there was a certain number of cases of physical abuse. And this certainly rose during the enhanced community quarantine. What was also seen was that children became unmanageable. And this showed that children had behavioral problems, probably due to the confinement at home and all this stress that they were experiencing. It also showed that physical violence tended to happen at home. And this was very telling, especially during the community quarantine. So what do we need to do? First of all, I forgot to tell you that there are online risks as well. The Department of Justice, just this pay, showed that in the Philippines, we had increased this online sexual abuse by 264% due to sexting and pornography online. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure that the child is with a responsible adult at all times. There is a routine daily schedule. We guide the child in TV viewing as well as social media. We talk about good touch or bad touch and keep the child healthy. Remember, take, be mindful of the child's emotions because when they keep asking again and again, that means they are anxious. And then report to the child protection unit. So, what, do, what happens after all of this? I'd like to go back to the Hippocratic Oath we made as doctors. We need to understand that the basic tenet of our profession is to first do no harm. And the currency of our profession is in the relationships we make. When facing an unknown challenge, it is possible only to do too much or maybe not enough at all because the very nature of the unknown makes it impossible to react exactly in the right way. Now, when it comes to the well-being and the health of our family, friends, and patients, we must choose to really do too much in the hope of succeeding. So what did we do in our institution? In our institution, as early as March of the time of the lockdown, we started to review our processes and policies and we had algorithms, which is in beta mode, meaning to say this is a continuously improving algorithm. It goes with the times. We also started doing our simulations with donning and doffing. 
we had simula simulation videos made by our by each duty group and we had the briefing after this we made sure that we also had our checklist we started to don our ppes despite the discomfort we felt we started to use aerosol boxes and intubation drapes and we tried to collaborate with other our other with other countries so that we would know how to go about this we collaborated we had donors we can take care of our patients safely actually without putting our lives at risk and also the lives of those who are working with us we certainly do not want to overwhelm the healthcare system so we must also remember what that we did not pursue a career in medicine to be a hero a hero faces insurmountable odds and unknown villains covid is not insurmountable and in the right hands it is not unknown so we need to do our part all the time so what else did we find out we found out that our pediatric anesthesia cases at our institution seem not to be decreasing or maybe there was a slight decrease but in terms of the cases, we found out that there was a change in case mix. In fact, even the manner, which means that we had more emergency cases than elective surgeries. We found out that our elective cases really dealt with trauma and teen pregnancies most of the time. So what happens after this? We need to make sure that we do have a way forward. We need to show our way forward, and that is by showing that we take care of ourselves. We need to take care of ourselves physically and mentally. We need to eat, sleep, rest, and remain hopeful. We need to protect our loved ones and the community. We need to stay home, remain informed, make sure we have the right information. We need to support our community by following public health rules. We need to, of course, wash our hands, practice cough etiquette and be altruistic if we can share more than save and show that we have concern for others remember that social science and clinical practice need to build upon each other for global health we need to show that after participation observation one must jump in and do even if it begins imperfectly medicine is a team effort and each member of the team is really important. Emotional health is real, mental health is real, taking care of yourself is important. If you don't, nobody else will. Our health is our true wealth. Most people learn to appreciate it only when they lose it. In this pandemic, so many did. So after having discussed all of this, I'd like to leave you with a Filipino custom that has helped us through the times, which is called the Bayanihan spirit. It is a spirit of the Filipino, a Filipino custom derived from the Filipino word Bayan, which means nation, town, or community. It refers to the spirit of communal unity, work, and cooperation to achieve a particular goal. And knowing this, doing this in our country, we would like to share this with our Asian neighbors and the world so that we can all heal as one. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Alinda, for your excellent presentation. And thank you for sharing how times have changed in the Philippines with this pandemic. Our next speaker is Dr. Brushali Ponde, who will speak to us from Mumbai, India. And her topic is, how has everyday practice changed with respect to pre-medication, induction, and regional anesthesia? She's a senior consultant pediatric anesthetist in various institutions in Mumbai with special interest in pediatric regional anesthesia. May I welcome Dr. Rushali Pondi. Thank you.
sorry for that. We will allow a few minutes to uh, for Dr. Brushali to set up again. Uh, I can see the numbers uh, of participants have increased and some of you are raising hands. Uh, please direct your questions to the Q&A group uh, section, which is in the lower bar of your screen, and we will aim to answer all of them. If there's a particular speaker that you would like your question directed to, please indicate. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Uh, perhaps I shall go on to the next speaker for now uh, while Dr. Brushali sets up. Uh, we will proceed with the next speaker who is uh, Dr. Evangeline Lim, who is a consultant pediatric anesthetist from KK Hospital in Singapore. And her topic will be airway management of pediatric patients with COVID-19 in this era. Please welcome Dr. Ev Evangeline Lim. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and hello everyone. Today I'll be speaking on the airway management of pediatric patients in the COVID era. I work at KK Women's Insurance Hospital, which is the largest tertiary hospital for children in Singapore. Um, Singapore saw the first case of COVID at the end of January and then a spike in the number of cases in March, and this resulted in nationwide lockdown with school closure in April and May. Um, there was full resumption of um, school only towards the end of June, um, after the nation actually started reopening um, in early June. To date, the number of cases nationwide stands at more than 47,000, um, and the number of deaths at 27. Um, the number of pediatric cases numbers at least 133, mm -hmm. and to my knowledge, none of them have actually required ITU care. Uh, with the ease in um, restrictions, the surgical workload is on an increase again after uh, experiencing a 45% increase in our elective workload. Um, um, but as you can see, we've kept very busy um, with emergency cases. The biggest change in our aesthetic practice has involved airway management. As I'm sure it has been for many of you. We have had uh, introduction of new workflows um, in our operating theaters, in the isolation wards, uh, the need for protection, as well as a choice of airway equipment. 
The goals in airway management, if I might remind everyone, um, are to keep our pediatric patients safe, that is oxygenated throughout, and also to keep ourselves as a nicetis safe. To do so, we need to remember that pre-oxygenation in children may be challenging. Children have a higher oxygen consumption rate, and therefore they desaturate much faster uh, when they um, go apneic. The pediatric airway anatomy can make airway management more challenging, especially for those who do not manage children on a regular basis. Airway management is aerosol generating and increases the risk of infection to the healthcare provider. Uh, in particular, uh, tracheal intubation, suction before intubation, as well as manual ventilation before intubation. There is a need to assume that all kids are COVID positive since many of them are actually asymptomatic. Last but not least, we need to be mindful of the fact that COVID is here to stay for a little while. Let's talk first about protecting ourselves during airway management. Um, donning full personal protective equipment is a must, and this includes eye protection. Uh, practicing good hand hygiene is also essential. Um, and the use of uh, specialized respirators, okay, such as the N95 mask or the equivalents or powered air purifying respirators or PAPR for short, because these are capable of filtering microparticles, okay, less than five micrometers. The use of physical barriers has been touted as a means to increase protection of healthcare workers. Um, but today, really, we'll discuss this very shortly. Aerosol generating procedures should be performed in an adequately ventilated room. And uh, last but not least, we need to be aware that communication issues may arise from the use of PPE. Let's discuss physical barriers. Intubation or aerosol boxes were first described as a means to protect intubators in the face of shortage of PPE. And as you can see, uh, numerous other prototypes have actually been developed, some of which are collapsible, or incorporate suctions and filters. Most certainly, there have been quite a few simulation studies that have shown a potential for reduction in the bio load on PPE. But does this really, really um, increase uh, protection of healthcare providers? And um, what is the role of physical barriers in difficult intubation? To answer these two questions, I'd like to discuss two recent articles. Um, the first paper was published in Anesthesia May this year by an Australian team, and what they did was have 12 consultant anesthetists uh, perform intubation without aerosol boxes, um, with um, the first generation aerosol box, and then a later generation aerosol box, and this was what they found. The intubation time with no aerosol box was significantly shorter than when either of these boxes were used. Also, the first pass intubation success rate was lower uh, when the aerosol boxes were used. There was also breach of PPE during the use of the aerosol boxes, which could then potentially put the intubator at risk. In another paper published in June this year um, by another Australian team, um, what it was to attempt to evaluate the laryngoscopist exposure of airborne particles using nebulized saline as the aerosol generating model. They compared using five different types of physical barriers, including the aerosol box, which is unsealed, uh, vertical plastic drapes, uh, horizontal plastic drapes, then the use of a sealed aerosol um, box in which the uh, openings um, uh, were sealed with uh, neoprene sheets, okay, and uh, rubber gloves. And uh, they, they used a sealed aerosol box with suction and without suction. And they compared these five physical barriers against no physical barrier at all. So what they did was they actually nebulized um, normosaline under the barrier and then had the patient cough every 30 seconds. And then they measured the microparticle size and numbers at the head level of the laryngoscopist. Over here, the green line actually represents the exposure of the laryngoscopist to the microparticles without the use of any physical barrier. And as we can see, the only physical barrier that actually resulted in the decreased exposure to microparticles was the sealed box with suction on. But um, the authors did mention that this particular physical barrier rendered tracheal intubation mechanically impossible. Um, by contrast, and interestingly enough, okay, um, the um, 
unsealed aerosol box actually resulted in increased exposure of the laryngoscopies to micro um, particles, particularly when the patient cough. So what can we conclude? Okay, so um, physical barriers may potentially increase the intubation time and reduce the first pass intubation success rate. And this could then potentially increase the risk of hypoxia, which children are already at high risk of developing. It may not be safe for use in a difficult airway. And in fact, uh, many authors actually recommend that you abandon the physical barrier should it prove to be difficult to manage the airway. It may not necessarily result in increased protection of the laryngoscopist. And um, there's a potential increased risk of contamination of the environment if the physical barrier is not carefully removed and cleaned properly afterwards. It, however, can be considered for use in extubation in a known easy airway. And I think if you must use it, um, please practice before use in a real patient. Adequate ventilation for uh, infection control is also important and the things to consider are ventilation rates, airflow direction, air distribution or airflow pattern. For um, aerosol generating procedures, ideally these should be performed in a negatively um, pressurized uh, ventilated room, uh, particularly for the COVID positive patient. Um, but regardless, um, you know, uh, it is important to know the number of air changes per hour in the room in which we are actually um, uh, performing the aerosol generating procedure because this would then determine the time lapse that is required for um, re effective removal of the airborne contaminant. So for example, there are only six air exchanges per hour, um, then uh, the time uh, required to remove 99% of airborne contaminants would be 46 minutes. Uh, conversely, if there are 50 air changes per hour, then uh, we might only need to wait for six minutes uh, for 99% uh, of the airborne contaminants to be removed. Okay, just to highlight that actually there have been various societies that have actually come up with consensus guidelines. And this was the latest one that was actually published in July this year in Anesthesia and Analgesia. And the consensus um, group uh, provided some recommendations for airway management in pediatric patients during the COVID pandemic um, and identified four themes, namely um, training, the use of cognitive aids, um, patient safety and clinical management, and then staff safety. I'll now share with you some of the things that we actually do at KK Hospital, where we've actually tried to incorporate as many uh, best practice recommendations as possible and feasible. We work in small teams. We ensure that all our anesthetists are fitted for N95 and air, um, eye protective devices are actually provided. We try and prepare as best as we can uh, before commen commencement of every case. And this includes huddling with our surgeons and other members of our team, um, drawing out the drugs and preparing our equipment, making sure that our trash disposal containers are open and readily accessible, protecting our work surfaces and donning full PPE. We consider induction, intubation, and extubation techniques that minimize crying, coughing, and aerosol generation. We pre-oxygenate if the child allows, um, and uh, we've shifted towards um, uh, more use of closed breathing circuits like the circle system as opposed to our previous more rampant use of semi-open systems like the ASTP system. Uh, HIPAA or viral filters are placed between the airway device and the breathing circuit, and um, more of us are also using curved tracker tubes, okay? Um, uh, and um, the, the use of supraglottic supra uh, airway devices such as the LMAs is not contraindicated. Um, if you can actually get it to sit well, and um, in both these uh, devices, if you actually cuff uh, the tube up, um, cuff the cuffs up before um, instituting a positive ventilation, uh, that would be ideal. And uh, of course, with the use of all cuff devices, it is important to measure the cuff pressure using a manometer. We also try and keep apneic time to a minimum or to minimize the need for manual ventilation. But of course, if the child needs manual ventilation, we do so with a good seal, with, uh, with the lowest uh, fresh gas flows as well as um, uh, pressures as, um, as required. 
We remove airway devices in the operating theater before shifting the patient to recovery if they are not suspected to have COVID. Uh, we try and minimize the number of people present at aerosol generating um, procedures. We wait five minutes before intubation and extubation before allowing other members of the team into the operating theater and you can see we actually utilize a timer to help us do so. Uh, we do not routinely use physical barriers um, uh, for reasons we mentioned before. And uh, we also try and um, ask our colleagues to pay some attention to uh, the contamin potential contamination of the environment, okay, by, um, um, by paying some attention to how um, we, handle, um, uh, um, we handle our gloves, et cetera, after uh, manipulating the airway. For our COVID um, suspect a positive case, we try and do it in our sole negative pressure operating theater. We don PAPR in addition to PPE. Um, we try and get the most experienced laryngoscopist to perform the airway management. Um, IV induction is preferred. Um, uh, the use of video laryngoscope is preferred to get the um, um, highest intubation success rate within the minimum period of time. We will remove any airway device in the operating theater. And in contrast uh, to other patients, we'll also recover the patient in operating theater before transporting straight away to the isolation ward. If the patient is not for extubation, then we follow uh, transport protocols to the designated isolation ward. There are other recommendations that, keep, that we keep at the back of our um, minds, okay? Um, in particular, um, the type of laryngoscopist, okay? Ideally, it should not be somebody at risk or immune suppressed. Um, we also uh, uh, um, uh, try to use, as far as possible, close inline suctioning for the use of COVID suspect or positive patients. As an anesthetist, we are called to respond to any codes that might happen in the isolation ward. And there is a code etiquette that has been drawn up to guide our management. The code team is actually split into inside and outside teams and we follow a designated communication route. Um, full PPE is done when handling the airway and if the child actually allows us to, we will actually don PAPR as well. We note the age and the weight of the child which is written on the door outside the room and this allows us then to decide on the drugs and the type of equipment um, like the size of the cuff endotracheal tube that uh, we'll choose um, to bring into the room itself. We use uh, the disposable micro video laryngoscope, make sure that the ventilator is set and suction is available before intubation, um, allow only essential people to remain in a room during airway management, and ensure complete paralysis with muscle relaxants before um, attempting intubation. Because COVID is here to stay, uh, continued training of staff is important. Simulation should be context specific to the role, and we need to orientate any new staff to current workflows and guidelines. This could happen on various platforms like e-learning, video, role modeling and coaching, making sure that information is rapidly accessible on chosen platforms, um, the use of cognitive aids and displaying these prominently, and then also uh, uh, assessments should be included in the orientation to ensure that everyone has really truly learned how to keep themselves and their patients safe. In summary, I'd like to conclude uh, by reminding us that we need to assume that every child coming in for surgery has COVID. Uh, we need to protect the child by ensuring that we can oxygenate and stay in control of the airway at all times. We need to protect ourselves with an appropriate choice of equipment, knowing our environment and how our teams function, uh, and practicing good hand hygiene. We need to anticipate and troubleshoot communication issues arising in our workflows, and also from the use of PPE. Um, we can consider using cognitive aids and do pay some attention to the training that goes on in our departments. With that, thank you very much for your kind attention and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Evangeline Lim. And uh, you have uh, enlightened us with your talk and how Singapore has managed so far. Uh, I noticed we still have more participants coming in. So looks like some of them have missed a couple of lectures already. But it's okay. I hope you can uh, catch up here. 
And if you have any questions, please direct them to the Q&A on the lower part of your screen. All right. And sorry about the technical issue with Dr. Brushali's talk. And she's back with a bang already this time. And uh, Dr. Brushali Pondey is a pediat consultant pediatric anesthetist speaking to us from Mumbai. She has special interests in regional pediatric anesthesia and uh, as well as all other areas of pediatric anesthesia. And she will talk to us on the topic, how everyday practice has changed in the COVID-19 era with respect to pre-medication induction and regional anesthesia. Please welcome Dr. Rushali. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt Dr. Rushali. We still can't hear you. We still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. You need to start so from the I a couple of slides and then speak, Usha. Would that be better? Yes. I think. All right. That Okay. Are the slides seen? Can I confirm that? Yes, slides are clear. Slides are clear. I am clear. All right. Yes. So we work with uh, three scenarios in Mumbai as such. Uh, we, we look at it as unless and until otherwise proved everybody is COVID positive. But then for practical purposes, we look at it as COVID positive. We don't know the COVID status of the child who is posted and then COVID negative as such. All right, now in this current scenario, what matters more, in fact, is to establish that uh, the COVID is, COVID negativity is established. Now, how do we go doing about that? Two negative RT-PCR results in 48 hours and an absence of suspicious symptom of viral infection is what we take as COVID negative. Alternatively to save time is one negative RT-PCR and a 24 hour later HRCT test is what can save time if we need to be very sure that the patient is COVID negative. Well, this is accessed from the website which I have uh, I have referred to you here and it was accessed just yesterday to make very sure that you get the latest information. Now the cases that we are actually dealing with are all emergency cases and very few elective cases in fact. The list is right in front of you so it's more of emergency in neonates and emergencies in pediatrics even with smaller emergencies such as INDs and so on. So the gist of my entire talk is going to be looking at past a glimpse of it as to how we did it and today how we have actually uh, gone ahead dealing with the whole situation. Did we premedicate? Yes, we do premedicate even now. Why do we premedicate? There is an added angle to it because it reduces separation anxiety, smoother induction, smoother recovery, and decreases emergence delirium. But in the whole thing, 
apart from what we always thought as pediatric anesthesiologist. Now what is adding on to it is decreased aerosolization that can happen at every step. If we reduce the thrashing and the crying at every step, we reduce the aerosolization and that's what the main aim is. Previously, we had fun. We used to have cars around. Here is one actually who's looking at the belt missing here, the car belt. We go with uh, many gadgets. We used to have fun. Today, at the most, what we can do is we could say we are walking on the moon. But if we have an IV, what we can do is we definitely can go ahead having an intravenous pre-medication, in fact. Here is an example of it. I am fully adorned in PPE, and I'm giving ketamine, medazolam, and glycopyrrolate. The baby is hardly one and a half year old and hence doesn't have a mask over him. And this is how he can be quietened in the mother's lap and then can be taken inside the operation theater, all very quiet. All I have to do inside the operation theater now is simply deepen the anesthesia. So this was one aspect of pre-medication. Oral pre-medication, of course, can be done and should be done. What can we be using out of all the plethora of drugs that are available is, we can use medicinal and we can use ketamine and we could use atropine. Now let's go into the thought processes of each choices. Midazolam in a dose of 0.75 milligram per kilogram is suiting us better with a combination of ketamine 5 milligram per kilogram. Midazolam shall give the sedation. Ketamine shall give the analgesia to take an IV without a resisting crying and a howling kid because ketamine gives analgesia. Atropin, yes, can decrease the secretions and hence decrease aerosolization. But the whole issue with atropin is it can also increase the temperature. And that is something can raise the antenna of everybody. So the do's and don'ts of pre-medications would be ensure a smooth acceptance of the pre-medicant itself because midazolam has a ghastly taste. Somebody may not just like a beardly dressed person approaching. So the mother herself can give pre-medication once you have given the syringe filled with pre-medication in her hand. Adequate time for the onset of action is something that we really need to be very, very sure of. Otherwise, the whole purpose gets repeated. And encourage wearing mask with the relative and the child when the child is more than two years of age. Nasal pre-medication is not acceptable. It's a no because it can instigate a lot of sneezing and aerosol generation. Parental presence would have been treated as a pre-medication before in, in the induction room, in fact, but now we do not really encourage them. There is a thought here that maybe that parent who is always with the child should also, in fact, be, take, uh, it, be investigated for COVID uh, status. Be Children who have airway issues, unstable patients, they should not be pre-medicated at all. So the take-home message is we always pre-medicate, we continue to be pre-medicate the children with or without COVID coming to inductions. It could be intravenous induction or it could be an inhalational induction. Now there are pros and cons to both. Although intravenous induction is absolutely preferred but when the IV is taken is what now matters. Are we going to take an intravenous access inside the OT with the child who's crying and resisting it? I guess it would be smoother to do an intravenous induction when the IV is taken in the wards itself. So all that we need to do is go ahead and extend it. At such times when the intravenous line is not uh, available, we could go for induction agents with certain precautions which are recommended. We go low flow, we go closed circuit with a, bacteria, with a filter in between the mask and the circuit and the filter in between the expiratory limb of the circuit and the machine. So low flow inhalational induction can be done if it decreases the agitation and crying of the child. So there are pros and cons for both, although an intravenous definitely is acceptable or more better when the IV is already uh, with us. This is something, is a big no-no. There cannot be an induction room and there cannot be a parent here. 
so this it would today's scenario would look something like this here we have already induced the baby the baby is in the kobi hood one of my very good uh, friend dr amjad marniar has actually designed it and it has lots of port you can work through and this is how a surgery would go on now inductions uh, as especially the inhalational ones would go fun ways prior to covid but in these days we have different kinds of fun to work with we really premedicate them well and start with intravenous so this is what we are actually doing one note that i want you to take off is suppose this is a case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia done thoracoscopically it's a covid negative patient but as evangeline already told us we are dealing at the head end and the maximum aerosol generation uh, area as such i guess we need to be wearing our ppes all the time is in spite of the covid status as such unless there is a real dearth of ppes although i do understand that ppe is a personal painful experience for understandable reasons but then all tests do have their own issues with sensitivity now an a simple ambu bag can be made more protective by inserting a filter as i have shown you in this figure we have come across with indigenous ideas of having tents and boxes done and you you too can do it with the available work resource that you have so the take home message here is intravenous induction is preferred inhalational induction is definitely possible a negative operation theater is a lot of civil work we do not have them right now and hence at least a neutral pressure ors are better with very few people while induction is going on a one experienced anesthesiologist one good technician and maybe all others can wait out till the induction is really done now coming to pediatric regional anesthesia and what has actually happened to pediatric regional anesthesia as an entire concept when it comes to today's area is what we are going to look at we are going to look at what paradigm shifts have happened in our day to day work the block choices what has happened to them and what do we think about continuous catheters as such and what are their roles today in the past we would have just given whiffs of ciboflurane tied a mask gotten along with a block especially please note my point especially for surface surgeries such as say circumcisions such as an obstructed hernia something on toe something on the upper extremity where it was totally surface we wouldn't have actually instrumented their airway they would have gone with a bit of ciboflurane iv insertion and a good block which would have given operability but today we probably should be going more towards intubations or well fitting second generation lmes so spontaneous ventilation if at all we go towards them it should be through closed circuits and filters placed and intubations is something that we are doing more often nowadays and of course lmas are also preferred now block choices how do we go about deciding our blocks we should be deciding on the blocks which we are very very sure of and will give the results that we want secondly it should require the minimum in in that case what i would say is with examples cordal remains the most relevant simple valuable portal to give a local anesthetic at least for the those uh, surgeries which can be covered under it now go ahead thinking about a tap block which can be an alternative or a ql block you need to pull out the ultrasound machine you need to take care of the machine you need to disinfect it it even before and after the procedure and this is going to increase the 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 flow around in the theater more people coming in and going out it's not that i am not recommending it it's highly recommended when it is absolutely indicated so go for blocks which require the least what are we doing about catheters these days yes we are using catheters let it be epidural or let it be a sciatic catheter or let it be even an upper extremity catheter in case of say 
a compound fracture which has just come over for uh, an open fixation. So yes, we could go ahead with catheters, but with catheters, we have certain do's and don'ts. In the sense, we are very sure that the catheter is foolproofly stuck. It is, uh, and the whole system is tamper-proof so that have good infusion pumps and uh, give them analgesia through these pumps which do not need much handling. Let us look at the pros and cons because they are there for us to really inspect. Now, what are the pros towards a continuous catheter? It, it, it can be even in a neonate, mind you. It gives a good pain relief. It keeps intact the physiological milieu. How? We avoid opioids. We avoid opioids, we avoid nausea vomiting. We decrease aerosolization in the wards if they are in the wards. Respiratory depression due to opioids and all the consequences are going to increase the aerosol generation. What are the cons? I put in a catheter, I set up an infusion, I have to go and see the child repeatedly and touch the, touch the infusion pump. So handling is repeated. And unless and until I have the team to troubleshoot the issues which are inherent to continuous catheters, I don't think I should be doing it. So I, I am openly telling you what the pros and cons of a continuous catheter are. Now there is this theoretical risk that I really want you all to note, but uh, it is only a theoretical risk because we haven't yet looked at it. Through, though the risk of epidural and subarachnoid space seeding with viramic blood, why the semic blood causing encephalitis or meningitis is extremely rare. It remains a possibility, but uh, thanks to whatever it could be, we haven't yet seen it. And there is no report of this as well. This is how you will take good e care of your equipment. Put them on plastic covers. See to it that you clean your equipment by the solutions recommended by that particular company. And see to it that you that that you change all these covers after each case and take good care of them. So, what is the take-home message when it comes to pediatric regional anesthesia? The scope and play, the benefits of it remain the same. Choose the block which you are more sure of. This is not the time to learn something new in regional anesthesia. Go with something that has worked with you all the time and take good care of your equipment. This is the regional anesthesia clinical guidelines that we have come up as the Academy of Regional Anesthesia. And I'm putting up to you the pediatric anesthesia paragraph for you to go through it. The Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthesiologists has also come up with a pediatric anesthesia and perioperative care advisory, which is an interesting read. And those who are interested, please give me a hands up and we, I shall email it to you all. I would be happy to do that. So, well, yes, we are under pressure. And yes, when rocks are put under pressure, you know what happens, they change into diamonds. So we are here to withstand and we are here to do what best we can do while we work in this pandemic. Thank you very much for listening to me and I shall give you over to the next, next speaker now. Thank you. Usha, I give it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Vrushali, for a very interesting talk. And I'm sure all of you are quite captivated by the speakers and all the different scenarios that they have encountered and how they have tried to manage in this Era. As you can see, most countries follow the same principle, but you know, due to many uh, reasons, it may not be exactly the same. May I remind the, the uh, attendees to please direct your questions to the Q&A section in your screen, which is at the lower bar of your screen, uh, because we will not be able to interrupt the speakers and answer your questions. All right, we will try our best to answer everyone's question at the end of this. Our next speaker is from Istanbul, Turkey. And Dr. Zera Serpil Ustala Ozgan is from Istanbul and she's a senior consultant as well as a professor of anesthesia. And um, she, her topic today is what we will try to do in the new normal intraoperative management. May I welcome Dr. Serpil. 
Thank you. Hi, uh, dear colleagues. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, hope you are not bored uh, on this Sunday with these months long uh, COVID lectures. Uh, now in Turkey, uh, we are uh, at the new normal stage of the pandemic and I will try to share what we are doing here. Actually, I'm working uh, for, um, for one of the leading uh, private health groups in Turkey and my hospital will not reflect all the country. So at the questions and answers part, uh, I uh, will, we will be very glad to share the experiences of my colleagues uh, since this pandemic is very new to all of us. Uh, in my agenda, uh, I will include uh, some data from Turkey and uh, how do we decide to operate in the new normal. Uh, and actually the new normal is not so different from the old normal when we consider the patient's safety. Uh, just some uh, details in the preoperative assessment we have. We have to decide whether the, uh, is, uh, the, is the patient COVID or not, or is this the only problem we are encounter? And how our practice has changed uh, during this period? And I will uh, review some precautions all my colleagues has mentioned before. Uh, in Turkey, we had our first case in March, and at the end of March, we locked down, and in mid-April, we had our peak. Uh, now, uh, we had started our new normal at June the 1st. Actually, in our hospital, we started at uh, May, I think. Uh, in Turkey, according to the situation reports of the Minister of Health, we had um, something like 200,000 laboratory confirmed cases. Uh, but we had uh, over 5,000, uh, we had lost 5,000 uh, people to this COVID. Uh, and our recovery rate uh, is 86% and the death rate is 2.5 uh, according, to, according to this report. Uh, when uh, the children, the teenagers and the children are considered uh, below 15 years of age, we had uh, 62 and 80 per uh, 100,000 cases. And the mortality rate in this age group is uh, lower than the rest. But uh, the mortality is increased when uh, the, the children below the age of two is considered. Uh, at the beginning of the new normal, we decided the surgeries, if the surgery was life-saving and preventing uh, rapid deterioration, or uh, is uh, the surgery prevents permanent damage or dysfunction, or if the surgery is not done, we expect some metastatic or infectious progress, progression. Uh, so we have two definitions more, semi-electives, uh, which should be operated in three or six months, or semi-urgent, which should be operated in uh, two or three days. But now, uh, in the new normal, we are doing all electives now. Uh, when we are giving the operative decision, we always remember that the patients can be asymptomatic or have some mild symptoms, but still they can highly be contagious. Uh, and also we uh, remember always that fluid shedding begins before the symptoms. And the airway is the place where the highest viral load is, and this is the place uh, where uh, we are dealing mostly, uh, and the people dealing with airways are at risk. So we have no escape, but we have to be careful for ourselves and for the children as well. In our preparative assessment, we have a questionnaire which uh, is very similar to the Adapers uh, one, uh, which the, in Adapers web page they have a very good um, rec recommendations. Uh, we use something similar like this. We take a, a detailed history, look for the symptoms, some rather examinations. Uh, in the preoperative uh, questionnaire, uh, we uh, do it uh, through teleconsultation sometimes since the patients, uh, uh, we uh, try to uh, make phone calls or WhatsApps uh, during these uh, questionnaires. We ask the COVID positive, COVID uh, contacts or if they have any complaints or do they have some symptoms. We have a detailed family history and we recommend them to uh, 
strictly isolate before and after the operation. Also, we ask for the vaccination programs since these may be delayed uh, since the people are at their houses uh, since the recent four months. Uh, and when they come to the hospitals, they uh, want to do everything at once. Uh, and uh, as a laboratory examination, we do hemograms. Uh, we uh, want COVID PCR from patients and the parents as well. Uh, we look at their pulse oximetry. We search for lymphocytopenia, lymphocytosis, leukopenia, and eosinopenia in their hemograms. If we have any su suspicion or if the child has some symptoms, we go forward for the uh, rest of the uh, blood tests related to COVID. Uh, according to this uh, very recent observational paper uh, coming from Bursa, it's a very big city uh, near Istanbul, they, uh, they had uh, observed 81 uh, patients, uh, 81 uh, children, uh, and the most frequent symptoms uh, they observed were, were cough, fatigue, and myalgia, and the abnormal laboratory findings were uh, decreased lymphocytes, leukopenia, increased LDH and C-reactive uh, protein and procalcitonin and D-dimers. They had 4% uh, uh, consolidations in chest CTs and 4% had ground glass opacities. Um, as you know, at the CTs, uh, tomographies, we can see union or bilateral opacities or superior changes and consolidations with a halo around very specific to the children. However, you can't do uh, every child uh, computed uh, tomographies. So this is reserved for uh, in our practice uh, for neurosurgical patients and for major surgeries. Chest X-ray is usually um, or half percent normal, so we don't go for chest X-rays. Uh, instead, we are trying to do ultrasound. Uh, as it is stated in this uh, very uh, nice uh, study uh, coming from two in Italy, uh, they look for the ultrasound of the uh, children and co uh, compared it with the chest X-rays, and uh, they saw the consolidations uh, related to viral pneumonia. So we are doing uh, these um, ultrasound before the patients, and uh, through our webinar series, you will uh, you will. Notice uh, that we have a program of uh, seeing this focus in one of the webinars. So after preoperative visit uh, and teleconsultation, if we suspect the child is uh, very strongly COVID, uh, COVID related, so we go for COVID test and if it is possible, a positive, we inform the surgery and consult the patient as COVID and go for treatment. But if we have a, a poor suspicion, then we uh, search for the contacts uh, and the, the risky uh, part. Then if, it, uh, if the child has risks, then we want COVID PCR again. Then if there are symptoms or other infectious diseases or in lab findings, uh, then we accept this as for, for probable COVID-19, then we discuss it with the surgery. If it is possible, uh, we cancel the sim uh, operation until the symptoms disappear. But if uh, the child is asymptomatic, and uh, but our surgery is major, or we expect some aerosols around, or the, the child has contacts with COVID-positive uh, patients, then we do the COVID-PCR. Uh, if it's possible, inform, uh, positive, we inform the surgery. But if it, it is negative, we uh, go uh, on surgery. Uh, these are the covers we made ourselves in our, uh, we and our very precious analysis technicians uh, did them uh, themselves in the operating theaters. We use them, uh, but we hardly use the boxes because we uh, are very away from the box, uh, patient with these boxes. If the child is big, yes, you can see the ch uh, child below the, the covers, but uh, if the child is small, you see how we struggle uh, under the uh, covers uh, to intubate the patient. So it's difficult to see the baby under the covers and safety comes first. Uh, so it's uh, necessary to care for the uh, children first. Uh, like in this uh, paper, uh, we prepare the beds before uh, the patient comes in. We use um, airflow warmers, but we put them on the bed, but we put covers over it. And we put the aspirator underneath the surgical tent, put the barriers, etc., and cover the patient like 
uh, similar, very similar to this. Uh, as an anesthetic technique, we, uh, in order to prevent cough and crying, uh, we use, uh, we try to use mostly Tiva, propofol, lidocaine, and amifantanil. Um, it is suggested to refrain from postoperative ventilation after induction, but as I, my colleagues has said, we use small, gentle tidal volume since these babies have very, reserve, very low reserves of oxygen. Uh, we use uh, rapid sequence induction and uh, deeply paralyze the patients. Um, sometimes we use two people mask ventilation. Uh, smooth extubation is essential, so we sometimes use low dose propofol, low dose remifentanil and decrine and um, uh, extubate smoothly. Uh, when we have, uh, although very rare, COVID positive uh, patients at the operating theaters who come for tracheostomies or some other emergencies, it's it's necessary to be careful with the drug interactions if the child is under, under therapy of COVID-19, uh, since uh, as it is uh, stated in the uh, web page of uh, ADAPF, uh, some of our drugs has uh, interactions with uh, antivirals mostly. Uh, so uh, we uh, use air warming blankets, but it is not suggested to use no air uh, blankets, but we use covers over them in order not to uh, push forward the aerosols. No aerosols, no crying, no shouting, no coughing. We don't use nasal premedication since the child may sneeze, as Shali has said. Uh, we don't want any coughing in ex at extubation. Uh, we don't want any nebulization inhalation. We use instead no parents around, no nasal oxygen, face mask only we use. So, uh, as all my colleagues have stated, we have to be ready with all our means, with our PPEs, drugs, equipment. Effective premedication is essential, no crying, no coughing. IV induction, if possible, is preferred. If necessary, we use small tidal volumes with lowest possible flow. Uh, positive pressure ventilation with a perfect sealed mask under covers. Neuromuscular blood, uh, blockades, intubation with rapid sequence uh, induction without coughing. We use cuffed endotracheal tubes and uh, video learning scopes and experience and studies uh, does them. Um, closed system aspiration close breathing circuits and filters. Uh, we use classical LMA mostly, a perfect seal with no leak around. So uh, post seals and the agiles are not preferred in this uh, respect since they may have some leaks. Uh, TIVA is preferred uh, and we wake the patient in the operating theater, not at the recovery. So everybody has lost very precious people, lots of people, energy, time, uh, and many, many things. We don't know how many springs and summers we have rest, but hope the world will get rid of this crazy virus and risk money very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Serpil, for your very interesting talk. May I remind the audience again Please direct your questions to the Q&A section, which is at the lower end of your screen. And we will try and answer them individually, or some of the pan panelists might try and answer them for you at the end of the talk. And don't forget, at the end of this, there is a survey that you would have to fill up, and you will receive an email certificate for attending this webinar. Our next speaker and final speaker is Dr. Sunirat. And uh, she will be speaking to us from Bangkok. And her topic today is the anesthetic consideration in the critically ill pediatric COVID positive child. Well, thank you very Welcome, much. Dr. Sunira. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nia. Uh, for me, it's the last speaker uh, with the topic of anesthetic consideration for the critically ill pediatric COVID 19. The critically ill pediatric COVID-19 is a very sick pediatric patient. Uh, they may need respiratory and no hemodynamic up to extra corporeal life support. They are very high risk for morbidity and mortality and high contagious. 
when they need anesthesia and the help from anesthesiologists, usually for emergency intubation, or really need anesthesia and surgery, or at least for transportations. So when we have to deal with this kind of patient, even we did not have to deal with uh, very often, we need to have a total evaluation that we should do it with experts who take care of the patients. And also we need to have a careful preparation, not only for care of the patient, but also for prevention of contamination. This should be done with experts in the spatial environment, uh, especially the negative pressure in the learning. Anyhow, and most important, all preparation should not delay the treatment, especially intubation and spatial care. At least, we have also to prepare for complication and more care organ support. And uh, I would like to announce for the next ASPA, that is all about curling, pediatric and neonatal CPR, and recent advance in perioperative pediatric ventilation that uh, will be held on August 16, 20, and 20. That you will hear more about current cardiopulmonary resuscitation and also how we can ventilate safely in our pediatric patients. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I would like to return to Dr. Nia again. Thank you, Dr. Sunirat. So that brings us to the end of our program and we now will have the Q&A session. Uh, I will uh, direct some of the questions that have been uh, uh, directed to some particular speakers. Um, Dr. Vrushali, there are some questions for you uh, with respect to uh, how do you disguise the taste of oral ketamine? And um, to clarify the, pre uh, the parental presence during inhalational induction. Would you like to answer that? Uh, the question is from Wangui Tanga. Two questions from Wangui Tanga. Uh, thank you, Wang Hui, for your question. Yes, sometimes it's very difficult to really mark the taste or camouflage the taste of these agents. In my practice, we keep sugar around. So we put sugar in the child's mouth to begin with and then give the calculated uh, dose of medication and again give some sugar. So we call it sugar sandwich, but then it can be given in a strawberry flavored protein syrup or any other agent that you have. And we encourage the mother to do this rather than we ourselves. Now, you want the clarification on the uh, presence or absence of parents as such. What I meant was there are certain, uh, not the corporate ones, but there are certain nursing homes or institutions where parental presence is allowed. So they can actually take their baby inside and, uh, you know, even hold the mask for us while they go to sleep. So once they start uh, you know, drooling and in, I mean, dropping in sleep a little, we let the parent go out. Uh, but of course, we assess whether the parent is uh, is strong enough to uh, see all this in the operation theatre. I hope I have answered your question. Okay. Uh, there's another question here from. Um uh, yes, uh, yes, would like you to share your uh, regional anesthesia guidelines. And um, he's given his email address to you. All right. So, um, uh, Navdeep Senthi asks, in the absence of negative pressure OT, is it better to switch off the air conditioning and or increase air exchanges? Um, oh, well, we switch off the ACs when the babies are small for other reasons as well. But uh, if at all, we want to increase the air exchange, it has to be 25 times. So we switch off the ACs till it's done with the COVID hoods around us. 
or tents that we make with a negative suction. So we can do both, but if at all the air exchanges happen, it has to be for 24, 25 times. Okay, just give me a minute. Um, uh, Sandeep, Sandeep. Sandeep Mutha has asked the panel, has the use of succinylcholine increased in the COVID era for RSI? Dr. Serpil, would you like to answer that? I think Serpil should mute, unmute her, sir. Sorry, I cannot hear. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, I'll repeat the question. One of the participants, Sandeep Muta, has asked, has the use of succinylcholine increased in the COVID era for RSI? Uh, actually, uh, we are not using uh, succinylcholine um, almost uh, over 10 years. Uh, we are, if we need it, we use rocuronium uh, and um, rapid sequence induction is possible with propofol and remifentanil and rocuronium very easily. Uh, so uh, we don't use succinylcholine. Um, actually, uh, are, are, are there any panelists that uh, can answer also? No, actually, I can see from where the question is coming from. Sandeep probably is asking this question because he may not have the rocuronium and remifentanil uh -huh. with him. So maybe, but uh, uh, yes, I do agree with Sarpil. It's not very rampantly used scol scoline as such even today because we do have certain other agents such as to begin with propofol, sevoflurane, and even atracurium. It doesn't take as long to get the intubating conditions. But yes, if you're used to scoline, there is no harm using a scoline as long as we know what scoline does and what can be uh, done to prevent all that. And during intubation also, we use lidocaine uh, to prevent coughing and uh, to relax. So it's uh, very useful. Yes. Okay. Um, there, ha there is a question from uh, Serene Lim, who asks, what is the goal of, uh, mini uh, is one of the goals of minimalizing AGP uh, by performing deep rather than awake extubations? And uh, are they routinely given uh, IV lignocaine prior to extubation to minimize coughing or other drugs in adjuvants like DEX or small doses of ketamine or propofol. Can someone help to one of the panelists please answer? Maybe now Evangeline can answer the question because uh, we have Evangeline. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, so actually, I, I do think that it is, um, it is dependent on your personal practice because there are some of us who will always know how to extubate awake with, while minimizing um, coughing and, uh, and therefore other forms of aerosol generation. Um, but there will be many of us too who will be very comfortable extubating and only comfortable extubating a child deep right um to try and minimize coughing so i would say stick to the normal practice that you do because you will do it best and you will know best then how to um how to modulate your own practice in order to um, further reduce the risk of generating aerosols i don't know if this answers your question <laughs> Perhaps others can also comment and chip in too. 
Anyone else would like to comment on that? Uh, actually, uh, in um, in lots of richer literatures, it's saying that uh, opioid-free anesthesia, but sometimes opioids also help uh, for this extub uh, deep extubation or comfortable extubation, we can say. Uh, uh, and the lidocaine and remifentanil also helps uh, smooth extubation, as Evangeline said. But uh, with what you are comfortable with is the best. Um, if I can just add on, um, I think one other thing that you need to consider is that if you actually extubate deep, then um, the child may still go into laryngospasm and have you need to manage um, an emergent airway too. So um, this is something that you need to consider So, in your practice. Okay, thank you for answering that. Uh, another question here from Moises Yu. Uh, in using rocuronium, do you have to stand by Sugamadex all the time? So. You are mute. Evangeline, would you like to answer that? <sighs> Sorry, sorry. Can you just repeat the question again? Okay. Moses Yu has asked, in using rocuronium, do you have to stand by Sugamadex all the time? Okay, actually, I think that this question should be directed um, in places where, um, where rocuronium is used routinely and SUCS is not uh, used at all because mostly in uh, my practice, we use uh, succinethonium. Uh, Dr. Sapil, do you want to answer the question? Again, again Rusha, let me say that um, if I comment, uh, don't, people don't have Sugamadex everywhere. Uh, I know this, but <laughs> since because of the secretions and the spasms are uh, very high with uh, neurostigmine and uh, we have to use atropine. Uh, almost four years, uh, I'm always using Sigomadex since we have it, uh, and it's but becoming cheaper, not so cheap, but when you use it with children, it's a um, very small dose. Uh, so with one or two flacons, I can do a, a whole, whole day list. Uh, and I always keep Sigomadex with me, uh, but I'm the wrong person to answer this. <laughs> Dr. Vrushali, would you like to comment? Oh, I, I agree with Sarpil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. And act, act, actually, it, uh, it, it is pretty interesting that we talk here, but we do not see whether the person who's heard our answer is actually pretty satisfied with what we have answered. So we would love to see that. But I guess that is uh, what the webinar is all about. Okay, uh, we have a lot of questions here. So I'll move on to uh, another question for Evangeline from Padek Agus, who says, um, if, are there any differences in aerosol virus from face mask, LMA and intubation? So is there a difference in using a video laryngoscope versus direct laryngoscope? Okay, so I, I don't actually believe that there are any studies that have actually shown whether uh, there's greater aerosol generation one way or the other. Um, I, um, I think what we do know is that intubation definitely generates more aerosols, okay? Com um, and in the same way, I think tracheostomy also does and bronchoscopy also does and, um, and a manual ventilation does and inline suctioning does. So um, I, I think I did show the slide um, and this is actually available in, um, in various papers as well. Uh, the risk of transmission of these, um, uh, 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 the risk of acquiring infections um, uh, consequent to aerosol generation from um, those various procedures. And top of the list is actually tracheal intubation. So um, um, I think you need to bear in mind whatever way you choose that ultimately 
uh, you need to keep your patient oxygenated and you need to achieve the targets that you need to achieve for your particular patient. If you can get away with face mask or with the use of LMAs, okay, which um, I think the consensus guidelines agrees that if you actually have got a um, second generation um, 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 LMA, uh, that, would be, that would be preferential right uh, with a good seal right in the same way that if you choose to intubate your patient again uh, the suggestion generally would be for um for you to, you to use a cuff tube simply just because you want to minimize the number of intubations or attempts for your patient so similarly um the use of video laryngoscopes okay uh, i think for a routine uh, case in which you know that a patient has got very low risk of COVID, I don't think there's any problem using a direct laryngoscope. But wherever you have actually suspicions, then really a, a video laryngoscope uh, can increase your chances of um, having a higher successful first intubation attempt. I hope this answers the question. Thank you, Evangeline. Uh, I think this question, uh, uh, maybe Dr. Sunira can help to answer. Uh, and Michelle Salomon asks, what medications and infusion dosages do you use for TIVA in critically ill children, COVID children for surgery? Oh, COVID patient for surgery, uh, for the dose, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for the dose of uh, infusion, we do the same as the non-COVID patient. Like uh, we do some propofol, and if we do some of the uh, very short procedures, like uh, for lie placement, uh, we use the... Uh, for lie placement, uh, we use the uh, dexmethetomidine that uh, it uh, works very well, and uh, we can stop it uh, very fast for this kind of patients. And uh, I, I would like to add something about succinylcholine because I'm the one who wrote the guideline for the uh, emergency intubation for the COVID patient in my country. Uh, Sometimes we recommend to use the succinylcholine, but for pediatric patient, you have to be very careful uh, because uh, we just have one patient just have a malignant hyperthermia uh, when we use the uh, succinylcholine, uh, and I agree with that, rock chromium may be the good choice. And uh, if the if the kid is not wearing glove, we can wait and use very small of the sucamidic if we need it. I hope it answer the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunirat. Uh, a few of the participants have uh, asked a similar question. And that is about PCR testing for all pediatric patients for elective surgeries. And uh, are we following that? So I, my take on this is that uh, I think it depends on the country. And uh, not, not all countries are routinely testing kids electively for, with PCR. And uh, it's only done if it's indicated. In Malaysia, we don't. We don't test all kids. It's only done if it's absolutely indicated. So our screening history is very important. Um, so maybe uh, the panel would like to answer this. Maybe Dr. Elinda would like to answer us first. Dr. Elinda? Yes. Um, hello. With regards to the testing, actually, there is no hard and fast rule at the moment. Of course, it would be good to make sure that everybody could have this testing. But as you can see in different places, at different, in the, um, different economic uh, status of patients as well, it is quite difficult to have this testing. In children, however, even based on other um, webinars, other um, experts from, from other countries, they have also said that what is more important is to ensure that we get the right history, do a good physical examination, and it will depend on the symptoms that they present with at that particular time.
Um, may I also comment? Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Dr. Serpil, uh, yes. I think everyone yes. in the panel can comment on this because we are all from different countries. Yes. Uh, first, uh, we uh, do the test uh, for every patient. But uh, since June until now, I think almost we had one, over 100 patients. Uh, I mean the children. We had only one uh, parent positive, but none of the children has COVID positives. Uh, it is very difficult to catch the virus there at their uh, nasopharynx. Maybe stool testing uh, may be meaningful, but it's very difficult to find it. If the test is positive, uh, we do that uh, just not to proceed with a positive child for an elective surgery. Uh, but if it is negative, we explain to the parents that uh, the test is not so sensitive and we uh, can um, not catch the virus there, uh, but it's a finding. So we do the test, but explain the results and uh, what are the findings there. Uh, actually, we accept them all positive, but if the child is really PCR positive, then we don't proceed with the surgery. Ultrasound helps, uh, ultrasound uh, of the lungs uh, sometimes helps, uh, but we don't have any cancelled cases due to this uh, finding as well. Anyone else would like to comment? Dr. Brushali, how is it in Mumbai? Are all, all children being tested? Uh, all elective children are being tested. We do have their COVID report as if we have the HIV and the HPSH reports. We have the COVID reports because it, Mumbai is a hot spot here. But of course, in emergencies where we do not have the time, we take up the patient and then we situate that each and every person in the operation theater adorns the full uh, level PPE and we send the swab though. And later on, we get the results. So it has happened that we have we have gone ahead, done the case, and we have then come to know that the the swab was positive, the RT PCR was positive. Even such incidences have happened, and then the whole lot it goes in quarantine. So this. So we have, for elective work, we have made it mandatory to have an RT-PCR, although we do understand the limitations of it. Okay, thank you. What about Dr. Evangeline? How is it in Singapore? Uh, we don't routinely test all the patients at the moment, uh, basically because that's our institutional guidelines. Uh, I think we need to balance against, um, uh, you know, how many kits we have actually have for you okay um uh, in consideration of the um overall national situation um, so, um they do have a lower attack rate which means that uh their chance of getting the, the, the um covid is actually lower compared to adults yeah but we also do know that they can be asymptomatic as well so for the moment we limited our testing mainly of risk um, because uh, from either from the history or from the symptoms that the child may develop. If uh, the child is um, COVID positive, none of us are likely to proceed unless uh, there is a very strong surgical indication to carry on, uh, for example, in an emergency right um and and if we do so then it will be with full pp but thankfully we actually haven't seen this situation so far <laughs> no Usha, just while i was listening to evangeline one more thought that came in my mind that i must share here is say during abdominal emergencies when we do ask for a ct abdomen we also get hrct chest done at that time which is really a very sensitive indicator of infection uh, so whenever we get a chance, uh, we try and uh, do things which uh, will help the healthcare professionals as well. Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Dr. Sunira, do you test in Bangkok? Do you test all children coming for surgery in Bangkok? Uh, in Bangkok, uh, at first, uh, in my university and in the country, uh, we test all children. And recently, the incidence of the COVID is very low. But anyhow, we take a lot of history, especially when the child had some kind of infection in the family. And also, uh, we, we found a child went to the market with the grandmom and got infected. That is a significant uh, history. But anyhow, uh, even we, we need a very sick patients, uh, we should proceed for the intubation because uh, we have one kit that uh, we have to wait for the COVID result coming back and delay intubation and the kid got cardiac arrest. So that is the, an example that don't wait for the result of the, the COVID. And if we need to do anything, we jump for that. And if we need to wear the PPE or, or anything, we need to go from that and use the video laryngoscope if we need it. Okay, thank you everyone, all the panelists and our wonderful speakers for your contribution and your talks. And uh, I, I think uh, everyone's talk has been very enlightening and it is so uh, nice to hear about all the different perspectives from different countries. And uh, thank you to the participants uh, for attending. Uh, we have logged on about 390 participants here and I urge you to fill up the survey uh, which is available at the end of this uh, webinar and uh, you will receive an attendance certificate. Please log on to our next webinar which will be in August and we aim to hold this on the third Sunday of every month and uh, as you can see the next uh, one in August is on the 16th of August and we will have two speakers, uh, Dr. Adi from Indonesia and Dr. Sumirat. And it will be about current pediatric and neonatal CPR and ventilation. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for your time. And I really hope that all the talks have been useful and that your questions were answered. And thank you to all our panelists and thank you to our dear Teddy, who is behind the scenes. And we couldn't have come this far without him. And we actually wanted him to be seen, but he doesn't want to be seen. So thank you, Teddy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.